Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of our episode on the Dreyfus Affair. And last time, we talked about the state of things in France between 1870, when the Franco-Prussian War began, and 1894, when Alfred Dreyfus was accused of selling military secrets to Germany. Honestly, even though that was two-thirds of the episode, that was a brief discussion of all that context. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, There is a lot of context in that earlier episode, including the things that led Dreyfus to join the French army in the first place. So this episode is going to make the most sense uh, if folks have listened to the earlier one first. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off, which was with Dreyfus being suspected of treason in early October 1894. The accusation against Alfred Dreyfus followed the discovery of a torn-up document known as the Bordereau. Bordereau is a French word for memo or docket, and this document listed several other documents that its author could sell to the recipient. It was found in a wastebasket at the Paris office of German military attaché Lieutenant Colonel Maximilian von Schwarzkoppen. Dreyfus was not informed of what specifically he was suspected of having done, just that it was treasonous. And at the beginning, he seems to have believed that whatever it was that people thought that he did, like, this accusation was just a mistake. And surely, whoever had made that mistake would rectify it as soon as they realized what had happened. So trusting. Uh, Because this involved espionage, the investigation was supposed to be handled in secret. Alfred's wife, Lucy, knew something was going on very quickly as officials arrived to search their home and to question Lucy and their wet nurse, who was from Alsace. This questioning was apparently so aggressive and traumatizing that the nurse vomited afterward. This just made the interrogator, Commandant du Paty de Clam, even more convinced of Dreyfus's guilt. Multiple people he questioned said he seemed to be already convinced that Dreyfus was guilty and that he was just looking for things that would back that up rather than actually trying to find the truth. Because of the secrecy involved, Lucy was forbidden to contact any of Alfred's other family about what was happening or to try to get help. When she was finally allowed to write to Alfred's brother, Matthew, a couple of weeks after Alfred was first accused, Matthew was totally baffled, calling Alfred's perfect loyalty his strongest trait. At the same time, like Alfred, Lucy and Matthew both seemed to think that this was just some kind of mistake that the army would soon rectify. This investigation found very little evidence to support the allegation that Dreyfus had sold French secrets to Germany. As we discussed in part one, a handwriting expert had examined the Bordereau and claimed that the dissimilarity to Dreyfus's own handwriting was evidence that he had written it, calling it a self-forgery. But beyond that, it was all just suspicion because Dreyfus was a Jewish man from Alsace who did not always get along with other people on the French army's general staff because of his demeanor and his family's wealth. On October 15, 1894, Dreyfus was ordered to appear in person for questioning in civilian dress. When he got there, Dupati said that he had injured his finger and he asked Dreyfus to take dictation for him. Dreyfus agreed, and as he was writing, Dupati yelled at him, accusing him of not taking things seriously. Dreyfus thought that Dupati was angry about how he was writing down the dictation, so he tried to slow down and write more carefully, at which point Dupati grabbed him by the shoulder and announced that he was under arrest uh, under a charge of high treason. And at this point, Dreyfus still did not know what specifically he was being accused of having done. He finally got the details and was shown a reproduction of the Bordereau on October 29th. And when he saw this document, he felt deeply relieved because it so obviously was not his handwriting. He also knew nothing about some of the items that were listed. He couldn't sell information he did not have. And the bordereau ended with the line, Je vais partir en manoeuvre, or I'm going on maneuvers. Dreyfus had not been on maneuvers since the year before, and the document had been intercepted just the month before. None of this mattered to the people conducting the investigation, though. They made Dreyfus copy out the Bordereau repeatedly to try to show that there were similarities between his handwriting and the document. 
And no matter how he conducted himself or how he approached his answers to their questions, authorities were just inflexibly convinced of his guilt. Over the next few weeks, the psychological toll of this made him increasingly frustrated and desperate. Although all of this was supposed to be handled with secrecy, in late October, the anti-Semitic newspaper La Libre Parole, which was founded and edited by Edouard Drummond, published a huge and sensationalized story claiming there was an influential Jewish lobby that was attempting to get a Jewish army officer off the hook for treason. Drummond argued that the French armies allowing a Jewish man to rise to such a high rank was evidence that the army, and by extension France itself, was inherently flawed and corrupt. As we mentioned uh, in the previous episode, Drummond had been vocally anti-Semitic for years and had initially funded his newspaper through the sale of an anti-Semitic book. Details of the allegation against Dreyfus trickled out pretty slowly. After it became known that Alfred Dreyfus was the accused man, Jumont published a piece in which he traced the purported history of Jewish betrayers. This included Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ, Simone Dutz, who had betrayed the Duchess du Berry when she was trying to put her son Henri on the French throne after the July Revolution, also included Alfred Joseph Naquet and Arthur Mayer, who Dumont described as deceiving General Boulanger, who we discussed in the previous episode, with that deception leading him to ruin. Dumont wrote, quote, This is all just a fatal running to type, the curse of the race. Although the coverage in La Libre Parole was particularly sensational and anti-Semitic, it wasn't unique in its condemnation of Alfred Dreyfus. Overwhelmingly, French newspapers covered the story as though Dreyfus was definitely guilty with the case against him open and shut. His wife and brother felt completely at a loss, unable to get reporters to even entertain the idea that he might be innocent. Yeah, there's news reports basically convinced the, the most of the population of France that Dreyfus had definitely done this. On December 5th, 1894, Dreyfus was allowed to write to his wife Lucy for the first time in weeks. He asked her to send him his best dress uniform, hoping that if he wore it to his court-martial, it might demonstrate his honor and his pride in the French military. This court-martial took place behind closed doors from December 18th through the 21st. Three handwriting experts testified for the prosecution. The prosecution also introduced a letter from German military attaché Maximilian von Schwarzkoppen to Italian military attaché Major Alessandro Panizzardi. And in it, Schwarzkoppen made reference to someone described as, quote, that scoundrel of a D. Authorities claimed that D was for Dreyfus, but this letter was also in a sort of personal code between those two attachés, and it's not clear who it was actually about at all. But it was also pretty sordid and strongly suggests the two men were having an affair. This letter and another letter that implicated Dreyfus were submitted to the judges presiding over the court-martial as a secret dossier. The letter implicating Dreyfus was a forgery, and Dreyfus's defense was not permitted to see this, these documents, and they did not even know that they existed before they were introduced. The judges unanimously voted to convict Dreyfus on December 22, 1894. He was sentenced to life deportation in a fortified place, along with military degradation and payment of the expenses associated with the court-martial. We'll get into that after a quick sponsor break. Unsurprisingly, Alfred Dreyfus's mental state had varied in the time between his arrest and his court-martial weeks later. Sometimes he had been resolute and sometimes despondent and sometimes angry, but he maintained his innocence throughout, and he held out hope that he would not be convicted of a crime he had simply not committed especially since the only evidence that he knew about before the trial was the Bordereau. But after his conviction, he was simultaneously bereft and panicked, described as just having a total emotional collapse. Realizing that Dreyfus was suicidal, prison commandant Ferdinand Forzanetti stayed with him overnight and talked him through it, drawing on Dreyfus's values of honor and justice and explaining that suicide would probably be interpreted as an admission of guilt. 
Forzanetti became convinced of Dreyfus's innocence and became one of his very few supporters during the early part of this ordeal. Dreyfus was once again denied visits from his wife or other family. Lucy, who would only wear black until her husband was freed, started preparing for the possibility that she and the family might be able to accompany him into exile wherever that exile was going to be. She also started packing what she thought he would need for his imprisonment, although at this point she didn't know yet where he was going to be held. Edouard Drummond continued his sensationalized and anti-Semitic coverage after Dreyfus's conviction. On December 27th, La Libre Parole published an article suggesting that Germany should put up a statue in honor of Dreyfus. This article reiterated the idea that Dreyfus was not really French, saying that he hadn't really betrayed France because, since he was Jewish, his true loyalty was to, quote, the Temple of Jerusalem. Dreyfus appealed his conviction, but his request for a new trial was denied on New Year's Eve 1894. And then on January 5th, he was publicly degraded. This degradation was originally scheduled to take place on January 4th, and all the reasons for the change in the date aren't documented anywhere. Various people noted that January 5th fell during the Jewish Sabbath. For this degradation, officials came to where Dreyfus was being held and loosened his medals and epaulets and scored his sword to make it easier to break. Then, in front of assembled military units and a jeering civilian crowd at the École Militaire, an officer physically tore Dreyfus's medals, insignias, and epaulets off his uniform before breaking the sword over his knee. Then, Dreyfus was forced to march out under guard as the crowd screamed insults and anti-Semitic jeers at him. Officers' wives spat at him as he was taken from the courtyard, and as he was being transported back to prison, onlookers shouted insults and slurs and threw stones at the carriage. Newspapers printed a lot of depictions of this after the degradation took place, and in them, Dreyfus is pretty frequently shown as being stooped over and kind of cowed. But he faced this whole ritual shaming with an upright military bearing, shouting, they're degrading an innocent man. Long live France. Long live the army. When Dreyfus was transported to his exile, the army tried to avoid another mob scene by moving him in the middle of the night in secret. His first stop was at saint martin de Ré off the coast of western France. But he did not get there without attracting attention. A mob gathered when someone overheard his name when the train was stopped. For this move, Dreyfus had been taken from his cell without being allowed to gather his things, and he had left his pince-nez behind, and he got frostbite and bruises from the shackles during the trip. While he was held at saint martin de Ré, Dreyfus wrote repeatedly to the Minister of the Interior, asking for him to investigate the case and how it was handled. He asked for permission to write to Lucy more often as well. He was only being allowed to send her two letters a week. Officials at saint martin de Ré also held Dreyfus's mail, and they refused to allow him visits from a rabbi, sending the prison chaplain to him instead. When Lucy was finally allowed to visit in person, she wasn't allowed to discuss his case with him. Eventually, Lucy learned that Alfred was going to be sent to the French prison complex known as Devil's Island. This was a collection of prison facilities on the mainland of French Guiana and three small islands off the coast. The smallest of these islands was also called Devil's Island, and that was where Alfred was to be imprisoned. Lucy bought him appropriate clothing for the tropical heat, along with a medicine chest and a mosquito net. Dreyfus set sail for his transatlantic crossing to this prison on February 22nd, 1895, which was his daughter's second birthday. When he left, Devil's Island itself was being used as a leprosarium for the prison complex, and Dreyfus was held on a neighboring island while its residents were relocated and the existing facilities were decommissioned. As that was happening, he was held in a cell that was made from a converted guard's room, and he was allowed no exercise and kept in solitary confinement there for about a month. And during that time, he contracted intestinal parasites and had recurring fevers. Devil's Island is small and rocky, surrounded by treacherous waters that are home to sharks, all of which was seen as a natural deterrent to escape. Once he got there, Dreyfus lived in solitary confinement in a small stone hut with a corrugated roof that measured about four meters square, and he was kept under continual guard. He had a cot, a table, and two chairs, along with a bucket of stagnant water 
that was used for all purposes, including drinking. He was expected to cook his own food, but at first had no cookware or utensils and no grate for the fire. His water bucket became a mosquito breeding ground, and Dreyfus contracted malaria. He also had chronic dysentery, and he lost some of his teeth due to malnutrition. One of Dreyfus's very few comforts in this appalling environment was that he was allowed books and paper. Among these books were English language textbooks that Lucy got for him, and he used those to teach himself English so that he could read Shakespeare in its original language. But he was also ordered not to speak to the guards, and since he had no one else to talk to, that meant he was essentially held in silence. After his eventual release, his voice was raspy for the rest of his life. Back in France, Lucy and Monsieur Dreyfus were spearheading an effort to clear his name. That was something Dreyfus had no knowledge of since all of his mail was being censored. Félix Faure had become president in 1895, and Matthew had hoped that the new administration would be more sympathetic and that he'd be able to get some more support. But with the exception of the most anti-Semitic newspapers, which continued to relentlessly focus on and vilify Dreyfus, media attention had mostly fallen off. The general public perception was that he had been guilty and justice had been done. Because of his efforts to help his brother, Matthew faced suspicion as well. Authorities followed him, they read his mail, they bribed his cook to spy on him. But he seems to have been willing to talk to anyone who he thought might be able to help his brother. He was eventually connected to a physician and hypnotist, Dr. Gibert, who had a patient named Leonie who claimed to be clairvoyant. Matthew met with Leonie, who told him that Alfred had been convicted not because of the Bordereau, but because of secret documents that they knew nothing about. Joubert knew President Farah and mentioned this to him, and Farah apparently not only confirmed it, but also gave Joubert permission to share that information with Matthew. This was not Leonie's only detail that turned out to be correct. She also described Dreyfus as wearing spectacles when his family knew him to wear a pince-nez, and they later found out about his being unable to get them when he was moved in the middle of the night. All of this gave Mathieu hope, but then when Farah was asked again about the secret documents, he denied it. Um, I am really fascinated by everything going on with this clairvoyant, and I wish I knew more about, <laughs> about all of that. Uh, eventually, Matthew went to a detective agency in London, dodging secret police in France to be able to get there. And he realized that the public in the UK were a lot more sympathetic to his brother's situation than people generally were in France. So he thought that if English newspapers picked up his brother's story and publicized it, that might put more pressure on French authorities to act. So he started talking to newspaper editors. But this ended up backfiring. An English newspaper ran a false report that Dreyfus had escaped that overruled Mathieu's worries that such a story might lead authorities to treat his brother even more harshly. It turned out Mathieu's fears were justified. La Libre Parole and other anti-Semitic newspapers picked up this rumor and ran with it, alleging that there was a massive Jewish plot to smuggle Alfred off of Devil's Island. As a consequence, guards started shackling Alfred to his bed at night. In addition to being degrading and painful and causing injuries to his feet and ankles, this also made it even harder to deal with the insects that infested the hut. Yeah, there were, in addition to the mosquitoes, there were ants that bit, like a lot of stinging, biting insects, just that he could not get off of himself in the night. Eventually... Months after Dreyfus was deported to Devil's Island, Matthew started making a little bit more progress. He became connected to Auguste Scher Kessner, who was vice president of the French Senate, who originally was from Milouz, like the Dreyfus family was. Scher Kessner knew that Dreyfus was innocent. He had seen evidence of his innocence, but for security reasons, he could not disclose it. He kind of gave... Alfred's brother, the sense that, like, if he could come to him confirming the information, he would be able to, like, say yes or no, this is this is what I heard. So even though he could not confirm this to Matthew at the time, the fact that he seemed to know something that could exonerate his brother gave Matthew some more hope. 
Then, in July of 1895, Lieutenant Colonel Marie-Georges Picard became chief of the Army's intelligence section. As a person, Picard was anti-Semitic, but as he looked at the case, he also became totally convinced of Dreyfus's innocence, and he started trying to convince military authorities to act. Then in March of 1896, French intelligence officials intercepted another document in handwriting that was identical to the Bordereau. Since Dreyfus was imprisoned on Devil's Island, it was impossible for him to have written it, and its author was the real culprit, Major Ferdinand Wilson Esterhazy. We'll talk about that some more after a sponsor break. Earlier, we talked about how Alfred Dreyfus had no motive to sell French secrets to Germany. He was devoted to his wife Lucy and their two children. He was deeply patriotic toward France, and he was financially very secure. But Ferdinand Wilson Esterhazy was almost the exact opposite. He was vocal in his hatred for the French army. He was notorious for his abuse of alcohol, and he had a lot of very serious gambling debts, the kind of debts you might need a lot of money to pay off. When it became clear that Esterhazy, not Dreyfus, had written the Bordereau, Lieutenant Colonel Picard started trying to convince the army to act. But military officials were increasingly afraid of losing face, believing that admitting wrongdoing would weaken the army and, by extension, weaken France. Picard was removed from his post and transferred out of Paris. At this point, Esterhazy's involvement was not publicly known, but people in France were starting to take sides, with Dreyfusards supporting Dreyfus, maintaining Dreyfus's innocence, and anti-Dreyfusards doing the opposite of that. Over the next few years, newspapers published an enormous volume of articles and slogans and caricatures and editorial cartoons on this subject. Today, there are entire books on the art of the Dreyfus Affair and how that impacted the development of popular culture in France. On September 18, 1896, Lucy Dreyfus published an open letter in her husband's defense. And in November of that year, Bernard Lazare published a pamphlet called Judicial Error, The Truth About the Dreyfus Case. He sent it to about 3,000 French judges. Meanwhile, La Libre Parole published an article claiming that the pamphlet was false and that Lazare had been paid 5,000 francs to write it for the purpose of discrediting the French army. On November 10, 1896, Parisian newspaper Le Matin published a facsimile of the Bordereau that had been obtained from one of the handwriting experts involved with the court-martial. Matthew Dreyfus made posters showing the Bordereau next to a sample of his brother's handwriting. Meanwhile, a stockbroker saw a reproduction of the Bordereau in a newspaper and recognized the handwriting as belonging to a client he detested because he was an odious person, which was Ferdinand Walson Esterhazy. That client probably also owed him a lot of money. <laughs> probably, yes. <laughs> Word of all of this made its way to Matthew Dreyfus, and he spoke to Auguste Scher Kessner, who finally confirmed that, yes, Esterhazy was the person he knew had created the Bordereau. Esterhazy was finally publicly accused of treason in the fall of 1897, more than two and a half years after Alfred Dreyfus had been sent to Devil's Island. But when Esterhazy was court-martialed in January of 1898, he was acquitted. His defense claimed that Picard had made up the accusation to smear him. Esterhazy's acquittal was what prompted Émile Zola, who was at the time France's most famous living writer, to write an open letter to French President Félix Favre. This was published on the entire front page of the socialist newspaper L'Aurore under the headline J'accuse, and it came out on January 13, 1898. Zola accused the army of wrongfully convicting Dreyfus and covering it up, and he ended with a list of allegations against specific people, all beginning with Jacques and accusing multiple high-ranking army officials, the three handwriting experts, the offices of war, and the first council of war of wrongdoing. L'Aurore was owned by politician and journalist Georges Clemenceau, and it reportedly sold 300,000 copies of the Jacques edition. 
In response, other publications went into overdrive with anti-Dreyfus coverage, much of it deeply anti-Semitic, including, of course, La Libre Parole, the Catholic daily newspaper La Croix, and other Catholic publications. It was during this time that this became known just as The Affair and became international news, with people following the story particularly avidly in the UK and the US. The anti-Semitic media published during this time really fueled anti-Semitism all through France. Widespread, simultaneous anti-Semitic demonstrations took place all over the country on January 18th, 1898. Also in 1898, 22 openly anti-Semitic candidates, mostly representing rural areas, were elected to the Chamber of Deputies. In response to all of this, France's Human Rights League was established in 1898, and a French League Against Anti-Semitism had also been formed, in part because of all this, three years before. This period was incredibly divisive in France. A political cartoon titled Un Dîner en Famille ran on February 14th. Uh, In the first frame, a family is sitting down to dinner at a huge table with the caption, Absolutely no talk of the affair. In the second frame, the scene has devolved into an all-out brawl with the caption, They talked about it. Divisions appeared within numerous French circles. Different groups of people were not necessarily united in how they thought about this. Among the literary and artistic community, Degas and Renoir were anti-Dreyfusards, while Pissarro and Monet were pro-Dreyfus. Some socialists defended Dreyfus and saw his conviction as a clear miscarriage of justice that needed to be remedied, while others saw him as a class enemy because of his affluence and his position in the army. The Jewish community was also not monolithic in its response. Many Jewish Dreyfusards saw this as an issue that was broadly connected to fundamental human rights for all people rather than the defense of one Jewish man. Some joined the Human Rights League or otherwise advocated for justice and against anti-Semitism. Others converted to Christianity or changed their last names to try to escape the escalating anti-Semitism or just tried to be unobtrusive so that they might go unnoticed. And for many, many people, all of this went way beyond Dreyfus himself. There was a sense among Dreyfusards that the French Republic could not survive if this miscarriage of justice were allowed to stand and that the army should be beholden to the same just laws as the rest of the nation. Meanwhile, among anti-Dreyfusards, there was a sense that the French Republic could not survive if the army was weakened by exonerating Dreyfus. In February of 1898, Emile Zola was tried for libel because of his Jacques letter. He was convicted and sentenced to a fine of 30,000 francs plus a year in prison. The trial did not look into the validity of his accusations at all. Zola's conviction was upheld on appeal and he fled to England. On July 7th, Godefroy Cavignac, the Minister of War, publicized the purported evidence against Dreyfus. And in response, Dreyfusards published a series of articles countering that this purported evidence had been forged. And the evidence had been forged. As evidence of the forgery became public, Lieutenant Colonel Hubert Joseph Henri was implicated and arrested. He confessed to making these forgeries. There were additional forgeries that had been added to all of this over the intervening years, and he took his own life in August of 1898. In the face of all of this, anti-Dreyfusards generally maintained that these forgeries were a patriotic act that had been done for the public good. Henri was called a martyr for patriotism. As word spread, the Minister of War resigned, and Esterhazy fled to Belgium and then to London. President Farr resisted calls to reopen the case, but in November of 1898, Dreyfus was informed that his wife was petitioning for him to be granted an appeal. This was the first time he had learned about Esterhazy's involvement with the Bordereau, and he had absolutely no idea about the international furor that had been going on. On June 3rd, 1899, the combined chambers of the Supreme Court of Appeal ruled that Dreyfus was eligible for a new trial. He set sail for the three-week return trip to France on June 9th, 1899. 
As he departed Devil's Island, he reportedly said, quote, my confidence in the justice of my country is the same. It will be the honor of this noble France, the honor of our dear army, to finally arrive at a solution to this horrific judicial error and to its reparation. Dreyfus's second court-martial ran from August 7th to September 9th, 1899. His lawyer, Fernand Gustave Gaston, was shot in the back on August 14th, but the proceedings continued. On September 9th, by a vote of 5-2, to two, Dreyfus was again convicted, this time found, quote, guilty with extenuating circumstances. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. This was in spite of the fact that Esterhazy had confessed to writing the Bordereau, and Henri had confessed to forging documents that had implicated Dreyfus. By this point, the Paris Exposition of 1900 was imminent, and the French government was worried about boycotts by American and British visitors, especially since the prevailing sentiment in both the U.S. and the U.K. was way more pro-Dreyfus. Parliament voted to censure the anti-Dreyfus government, and on September 19, 1899, President Émile Loubet, who had become president after Félix Faure's death the previous February, offered Dreyfus a pardon. Dreyfus's health had really suffered during his years of imprisonment at Devil's Island and his subsequent voyage and incarceration. Many of his family members were worried that he simply would not survive long if he stayed in prison. They encouraged him to accept the pardon, even though being pardoned did not clear his name. Dreyfus did, and some Dreyfusards were disappointed in this. To many, he had become an almost mythic martyr figure. One said, quote, We were prepared to die for Dreyfus, but Dreyfus wasn't. Alfred Dreyfus was freed on September 20th, 1899. The Dreyfus family went to Carpentras and then to Switzerland as Dreyfus tried to recover and the family tried to just get some peace. Emile Zola had been given clemency and returned to France in 1899, and he died of an accidental carbon monoxide poisoning on September 28, 1902. Dreyfus really grieved over his death. Zola's widow, who had survived the same accident, initially asked Dreyfus not to attend the funeral for fear that it would bring detractors. But Dreyfus really felt that it was his duty to go. And it turned out that those fears were justified. Demonstrators shouted insults from outside the cemetery gates during Zola's funeral. When Lucy Dreyfus's father died not long after this, the family prepared for similar demonstrations at his funeral. And while these didn't materialize, all the worry about it and having to have a funeral with the presence of armed guards That just led Dreyfus to avoid public ceremonies after this point, including not attending later funerals of other prominent supporters. In 1904, the case against Dreyfus was reopened, and on July 12, 1906, the Civilian High Court of Appeal finally acquitted him. He returned to service in the Army as a major, which was a rank below where he would have been under normal circumstances. He was also named Chevalier in the Legion of Honor, with his knighting ceremony at the École Militaire on July 21st. Picard, who had tried to clear his name years before, was also reinstated. At the same time, a lot of people in France did not believe that he was really innocent. In 1908, after an announcement that Emile Zola's ashes would be moved to the Pantheon, Louis Anthelm Grigory attempted to assassinate Alfred Dreyfus, and Dreyfus was wounded in this attempt. Gregory was acquitted, with the court noting that he had, quote, dissented with Dreyfus's exoneration. Although Dreyfus retired from the army not long after his 1905 return to service, he returned to active duty as a lieutenant colonel during World War I. At that point, he was nearly 55. His son and several other members of the Dreyfus family also served. Many of them, including Matthew Dreyfus's son, Emile, were killed in action. Alfred's son, Pierre, was promoted five times during the war and awarded the Croix de Guerre with Palm, and Alfred became an officer in the Legion of Honor. His daughter Jeanne also married a doctor who served in the war. Alsace-Lorraine was returned to France after World War I. Toward the end of his life, Dreyfus was called on to speak out about the Sacco and Benzetti case. 
He said he supported French efforts to ensure that there was no miscarriage of justice, and he called the possibility of those two men's execution, quote, the greatest moral disaster of many years. This drew criticism from people who claimed that he was allying himself with anarchists and from people who did not think that his statement was nearly strong enough considering his own wrongful conviction. At this point, though, he was nearly 70, he was in poor health, and he was just trying to avoid a spotlight that he had never wanted in the first place. The Dreyfus affair continued to spawn controversy long after it was over. A play called Le Faire Dreyfus premiered in 1931, and that play was targeted with demonstrations, vandalism, and intimidation throughout its run. The performances were interrupted every night, including with people throwing stink bombs. This was one of many, many dramatizations of the affair, which started with a series of one-minute shorts by Georges Méliès in 1899. Alfred Dreyfus died on July 12, 1935, after a long illness. His brother, Matthew, had died in 1930. Lucy died on December 14, 1945, at home, having spent most of World War II in hiding with a group of nuns. Most of the Dreyfuses fled south to areas that were not occupied by Nazi Germany during the war, but Alfred and Lucy's granddaughter, Madeleine Dreyfus Levy, remained behind to work with the resistance. She was arrested and died of typhus at Auschwitz. The Dreyfus affair had enormous and wide-ranging impacts on the nation of France that lasted into and beyond World War II. It promoted additional efforts to separate church and state, which were finalized in 1905. The response from people like Emile Zola refined the idea of what a French intellectual was and the role of intellectualism in public life. The affair also stoked nationalism and anti-Semitism with a far-right, proto-fascist movement rising in the immediate wake of the affair and growing into the French Popular Party in the 1930s. This rising anti-Semitism connected to the Dreyfus Affair also sparked a rise in Zionism, drawn from the idea that the Jewish people should have a homeland that was free of anti-Semitic persecution. In January of 1998, just before the 100th anniversary of the Jacques letter, French President Jacques Chirac wrote a letter to Dreyfus's descendants that called the Dreyfus Affair, quote, a dark stain unworthy of our country and our history, a colossal miscarriage of justice, and a shameful compromise by the state. On January 13th of that year, a plaque commemorating Dreyfus and Zola was unveiled at École Militaire. And on July 12th of 2006, which was the centennial of Dreyfus's exoneration, Chirac gave an address at École Militaire, which was attended by the descendants of Dreyfus and Zola. In this address, he called Dreyfus an exemplary officer and also spoke about the dangers of anti-Semitism and hate, saying, quote, the combat against the dark forces of intolerance and hate is never definitively won. Uh, It feels like a bajillion years ago, but back when I hosted another podcast called This Day in History Class, we did an episode on this, which was, of course, much shorter because that show was five minutes long per episode, Uh, Our colleague, Christopher Hasiotis, did some research support on that installment of this day in history class. Um, And so I just wanted to note that since some of those sources found their way into this these several years later. (laughs) This is one of those episodes that every break that we've had, Tracy and I sit here and go, yeah, Um, yeah. Do you have a little bit of listener mail that makes us feel less grumbly and angry at the world? (laughs) I do. Um, It may or may not do that. It's from Karina. Uh, Thank you, Karina, for sending this note. And also, thank you, Karina, for telling me at the bottom how to say your name. That is a big help. Uh, Karina wrote, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I've wanted to write in for a long time, but somehow never have. You cover so many underappreciated topics on the show, and you've really opened my eyes up to history that hits close to home. Listening to the Paper Clipper episodes, I had to pull over and call my mom and then my grandmother. This time, though, you hit my family right on the nose. My grandfather was an engineer at Redstone Arsenal and then at NASA. His career highlights include the Saturn V and the Lunar Rover. Von Braun picked my grandfather to go to Antarctica for a month to use that desolate environment as practice for the buggy. My mom still has the penguin card from that trip. 
I've chatted with my grandmother about this, and she remembers having German engineers over for dinner after work. There is an apocryphal story of my mom's in which she saw one of them topple off the ottoman and then whisper to her that that was how gravity worked before dusting himself off and sending my mom, age four, back to bed. I wish I had been able to ask my grandfather about how he felt working with the German scientists and how much he knew about paperclips since it was such a poorly kept secret. He passed before I was born, and as my parents are mid-move, I can't dig out the NASA yearbooks for you. I'll find them and send you a scan. Meeting you at the live show in Seattle was the best. I enjoy getting to hang out with you both as I go about my day. So here is my puppy, Cerberus, best Karina. Man, Cerberus has the cutest puppy (laughs) face. That's like a weaponized puppy. Like, I would do anything for that dog. I'd be like, yes, yeah, of course you can drive my car. Whatever's fine. Whatever you want, puppy. (laughs) That sounds great. Uh, We've heard from a few people who either uh, are descended from folks who were part of Operation Paperclip or who had family members or other loved ones who worked with various paper clippers and other of those messages may make an appearance at some point during the show but thank you everybody who has uh who has written in to kind of share those connections to your own family i just i wanted to particularly read that one because i love the story about that's how gravity works and also the puppy picture (laughs) uh if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast we're at history podcast at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 